Hi, I'm Maggie Gunderson, founder of Fairwinds Energy Education, and today you're listening to a breaking news Fairwinds podcast of a formal press conference hosted by Friends of the Earth. Welcome to this breaking news event. In this press conference, you'll hear Damon Moglin, Senior Strategic Advisor with Friends of the Earth, Attorney Richard Ayers, founder of the Ayers Law Group, and Arnie Gunderson, Chief Engineer with Fairwinds Associates, and David Freeman, former chair of the New York Power Authority, the prior owner of Indian Point Unit 3, and an advisor to Friends of the Earth. Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's Friends of the Earth Indian Point Telephone Press Conference. At this time, all participants are in the listen-only mode. Later on, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions during the question and answer session. You may register to ask a question at any time by pressing the star and one on your touchtone phone. You may withdraw yourself from the queue by pressing the pound key. Please note this call may be recorded. I'll be standing by should you need any assistance. It's now my pleasure to turn today's program over to Mr. Damon Moglin. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> Thank you for attending this Friends of the Earth telepress conference on the dramatic bolt failure at the Indian Point nuclear reactors outside of New York City. This is Damon Moglin. I'm the Senior Strategic Advisor for Friends of the Earth, and I coordinate the organization's campaigns on nuclear power issues. I have worked on issues relating to nuclear power and nuclear proliferation for more than 30 years. Let me introduce the speakers you will be hearing from today. First off will be our attorney, Richard Ayers of the Ayers Legal Group, who has filed today on our behalf an emergency petition with the Commission of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Richard Ayers is among the nation's most knowledgeable and well-respected environmental attorneys. Since 1970, he has helped shape and implement many of the country's core environmental policies, including the Clean Air Act. Mr. Ayers' work has included representing clients before federal courts, including the Supreme Court, the NRC, the EPA, the U.S. Congress, and state agencies and courts. Our second speaker will be the nuclear engineer, Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Associates, who is the lead technical author of the report we are releasing today. <clears throat> Arnie Gunderson has more than 40 years of nuclear power engineering experience. He attended Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, where he earned his bachelor's degree, while also becoming the recipient of a prestigious Atomic Energy Commission fellowship for his master's degree in nuclear engineering. Arnie holds a nuclear safety patent, was a licensed reactor operator, and is a former nuclear industry senior vice president. During his nuclear power industry career, Arnie also managed and coordinated projects at 70 nuclear power plants in the United States. Our last speaker will be S. David Freeman, the former CEO of the New York Power Authority, NIPA, and a man who had personal responsibility for the oversight of Unit 3 reactor at Indian Point. Dave now serves as a senior advisor to Friends of the Earth. Mr. Freeman has more than four decades of experience directing federal, regional, and local energy policies. He was appointed chairman of the Tennessee Valley Authority by Jimmy Carter in 1977. Subsequently, Dave served for two decades as general manager of several large public utilities or power agencies, including the New York Power Authority in the mid-1990s, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, and the Sacramento Municipal Utility District. Dave is a renowned expert on clean energy efficiency and the risks of nuclear power. He holds a BS in civil engineering from Georgia Tech and an LLB from the University of Tennessee. I want to get to our speakers in a moment, but would like to say a few words about why we are here today. The situation we bring to you is actually very simple. A complicated and potentially quite dangerous machine is broken. The question is whether or not we will find out why and how it broke before the reactor is returned to operation. Will profits take precedence over safety? Let me emphasize the bolt failure at Indian Point involving degradation or loss of more than 25% of the bolts, which are a critical part of the reactor unit 2's core cooling system, is a very serious problem. In fact, we believe the failure of these bolts is orders of magnitude beyond that seen in any other reactor in the world. It's unprecedented. Failure of these bolts and the plates they hold, which channel cooling water to the reactor core, could lead in an emergency to a failure of the cooling system and a meltdown of the reactor core, as occurred at Fukushima. 
This would send a plume of radioactivity somewhere out over the nearly 20 million people who live within 50 miles of the Entergy reactors. If the wind were blowing in that direction, the plume could be over Times Square in 90 minutes. There would be no time for evacuation. In fact, as we New Yorkers all know, if there was a disaster at Indian Point, there would be no way to evacuate the millions of people trapped under the radiation in New York City and Westchester. We believe that the bolt problem must be treated as a top safety priority by the Nuclear Regulatory Authority, but the staff has not acted and has instead, at least so far, left it to Entergy to propose and start making repairs even before they have completed a full analysis of the problem on which to base the repairs. Because Entergy says they intend to bring Indian Point back online in June, we believe it is critically important that the NRC intervene and take charge. They need to assure that a full root cause analysis is done and that it forms the basis of any repairs that are made and that the NRC certifies that the plant is safe to run. We are also asking that the agency immediately instruct Entergy to bring Reactor Unit 3 offline so that the twin reactor can be immediately inspected to ascertain if it has the same problem. Friends of the Earth started in 1969 and began as an organization working on nuclear safety. Never in our more than 45 years have we filed such an emergency petition with the NRC. We believe that this is a major safety issue, and we demand that the federal safety regulators intervene. Let me now turn to our attorney, Mr. Richard Ayers. Good morning, everyone. I'm Richard Ayers. Uh, this morning, my firm filed, on behalf of Friends of the Earth, a petition with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for emergency action to assure that the two reactors at Indian Point, New York, are safe to operate. This filing is not taken lightly. A release of radiation at Indian Point, as you've heard, could affect nearly 20 million people and could potentially render our nation's largest city uninhabitable. The purpose of the petition filed by Friends of the Earth is to prevent a hasty restart of Indian Point 2 until the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission is sure it's safe to operate. Under the Atomic Energy Act, the NRC has the task of protecting the health and safety of the people of the New York City area. The safety of the plant is in question because it has been learned from new inspection techniques that the bolts that hold internal baffles together in Unit 2 are failing at a rate never before experienced. An inspection by Entergy, the owner and operator, shows that more than one-fourth of the baffle former bolts have become compromised and or failed. No other nuclear unit has ever experienced more than a 10% failure rate. The effects of these failures are potentially catastrophic and will be described further by Mr. Gunderson. In the case of Indian Point, located within 50 miles of tens of millions of people, there is no room for error. We believe the increased risk demands that the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission step in to assure safety. Why? Because Entergy, the private company that owns and operates Indian Point, cannot be counted on to protect the health and welfare of New Yorkers. Entergy had to be forced to investigate the bolt failures by New York Attorney General Eric Schneiderman. Entergy continues to plan to restart Unit 2 in June, whether or not it's completed a root cause analysis to find out why the bolts are failing. Entergy also plans to continue running Unit 3 for another year before finding out how many bolts have failed in that unit. Entergy is a private company, not a utility regulated by New York State. Its only corporate interest is making money for its shareholders. The duty to make Entergy a good citizen falls entirely on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. To protect the public interest, therefore, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission must step in to assure that both units are safe to operate. To date, the Commission has simply not become involved. In its petition, Friends of the Earth asked the Commission to take two major actions on an emergency basis. First, we asked the Commission to issue an emergency order 
preventing energy from restarting Unit 2 until the NRC is satisfied that it knows the root cause of the bolt failures and until the NRC determines that Unit 2 is safe to operate. Second, we asked the Commission to issue an additional emergency order to prevent continued operation of Unit 3 until it has been inspected, the root cause of any bolt degradation is determined, and the NRC is satisfied the unit is safe to operate. Now, the Commission unquestionably has the authority to take these steps. It has granted emergency relief in response to such petitions on a number of occasions in the past, uh, examples that are, are at pages 13 and 14 of our petition. Likewise, the Commission has on several occasions in recent years required licensees to provide the NRC with analysis and await Commission approval before operating troubled plants. Examples of that are on pages 12 and 13. We ask and expect the Commission to consider these emergency requests on an expedited basis. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ayers. Uh, our next speaker will be Arnie Gunderson. Arnie? Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson. I'm the Chief Engineer at Fairwinds Associates up in Burlington, Vermont. If you're taking notes, it's Gunderson has an E, S-E-N, and Fairwinds has an E in the middle of it. Unfortunately, during my 44-year career, I've witnessed five major atomic reactor meltdowns, beginning with Three Mile Island, and including Chernobyl and Fukushima Daiichi. And since the beginning of the 21st century, I've witnessed two near calamities. The first was in 2002 at davis Bessey in Ohio, and the second is happening right now with the mishap at Indian Point Unit 2. With the failure of 20, 227 damaged and missing bolts that are essential to the safe operation of that atomic reactor core. As Dick said, more than a quarter of these critical bolts in the core are missing. This is the largest number of failed bolts ever found in any atomic reactor anywhere in the world. Both Indian Point 2 and its almost identical sister reactor produce slightly more than 1,100 megawatts of electric power each. To adequately visualize what this means, let's look at the picture provided to you on page four of the um, technical handout. Trapped inside that 12 foot high by 12 foot wide reactor core is the energy equal to two and four and a half million horsepower. Envision almost four and a half million horses stampeding across a prairie, and you'll realize how much power must be controlled within each atomic reactor core. The core baffle that is held in place by slightly more than 800 bolts surrounds the atomic fuel. 227 of those bolts are seriously damaged or missing entirely. The core baffle acts like a cattle chute, and it channels a quarter of a million gallons of water at 550 degrees. That's the energy equivalent of four and a half million horses in a uniform direction that's absolutely critical to the safe operation to maintain control of the Indian Point reactor. The failure of more than a quarter of the bolts means that the baffle directing these 440 million stampeding horses, 4.4 million stampeding horses, is severely weakened and in jeopardy of failing to cool the atoms colliding inside. The near failure of the baffle means that a nuclear nightmare was just narrowly avoided. If the baffle had failed, see the picture on page five of the handout, cooling water could have bypassed the atomic reactor core, leaving the core <clears throat> with no method to cool it and causing a meltdown. Simply put, it's impossible to cool the nuclear fuel if the baffle plate fails. In 1966, loose parts from the Fermi-1 nuclear reactor caused a piece of sheet metal to break loose and plug the nuclear reactor fuel, creating a partial meltdown, during which someone in the control room uttered, we almost lost Detroit. The failure of the baffle plate on Indian Point 2 would create a much worse disaster, and New York City is only 26 miles away. In 2012, Friends of the Earth retained Fairwinds Associates 
to evaluate radiation leaks of the steam generator tubes at the San Onofre nuclear reactors. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission had already assigned a special 14-person augmented inspection team and issued a confirmatory action letter requiring NRC approval of the restart of the San Onofre after a root cause analysis was completed. Due to the near miss at Indian Point Unit 2, which is 100 to 1,000 times more dangerous than that which existed at San Onofre, Friends of the Earth is requesting this emergency petition to the NRC to both keep Indian Point 2 and 3 shut down until the ultimate root cause analysis has been completed. Well, what is an ultimate root cause analysis? Simply put, it's a thorough, time-consuming analysis that examines every possible cause of bolt damage and destruction. Replacing the damaged bolts prior to an ultimate root cause analysis may put significant stress on the reactor, causing a meltdown in the future. Focusing on Indian Point's immediate return to power production limits dedicated scientific inquiry and endangers the health of millions of people living nearby. By insisting that Indian Point 2 replace its bolts prior to analyzing the ultimate root cause of the bolt failures, and by allowing Indian Point 3 to continue operating, speaks to a failed safety culture within Entergy. According to the NRC database, currently the three worst performing atomic reactors in the U.S. are owned by Energy. And now we add to that list Entergy's Indian Point Unit 2. Entergy is rushing to fix an unknown failure so, to, so as to supply electricity during the lucrative summer peak market. And its almost identical sister plant continues to operate without any safety evaluation or risk assessment. After examining the evidence available to me, it's my professional engineering opinion that both Indian Point atomic reactors should be shut down and remain so until an ultimate root cause evaluation is completed and the defects are repaired, if a repair is even possible. Quite simply, the lack of evaluation possibility for Manhattan and the surrounding New York area aren't worth the risk for Entergy's corporate profits. Thanks. Thank you, Arnie. Our next and final speaker is uh, S. David Freeman. Uh, Dave. I view this situation from a somewhat different perspective than my employee, my uh, fellow colleagues here. I had the personal responsibility in 19, uh, late 93, 94, and 95 for the operation of Indian Point 3. And uh, I kept that plant shut down for two and a half years, not because the reactors were broken as they are now, but, but because employees were not following the rules of the NRC with sufficient uh, correctness to satisfy us. Now, there was a big difference. Uh, I was the head of a nonprofit organization, the New York Power Authority, and I did not have the pressure of stockholders and making profits. And so uh, we were able to put safety first, and we did so. And what, we, and what is so alarming about the situation that we have right here is that the company that is in charge of the plant now is not even regulated. In California, at least the utilities that operate the nuclear plant had a cost plus deal uh, with the regulator. And they could, if the plant didn't run, they still got their money. If they made investments in safety, they made a return on it. Here we have a company that has a single-minded objective, making money. And so they don't have a conflict of interest. They have a serious interest in running this plant this summer and because if they don't run it, they don't get any money. And uh, having been in the position of a CEO, the people in that plant, they will come to you and tell you it's safe. You know why? Because they really believe it's safe because they work there. It's almost like somebody that smokes cigarettes and doesn't believe they're going to get cancer. Uh, there, there's just such a pressure on the people involved to say this, it's okay because their job. 
That's the reason we have a nuclear regulatory commission, and which is to protect the public against the uh, monetary incentives of a company uh, like uh, like this that just wants to run the plant and doesn't have the public safety as their first priority. Uh, and that is why it is absolutely crucial that the NRC take charge here and that it is the NRC that, that decides and that it permits mm -hmm. experts like Mr. Gunderson and others uh, to present evidence. Right now, this whole thing is hidden behind the nuclear curtain where nobody really knows what's going on except uh, the private company who's just desperately trying to get the plant back on. I would also want to comment that having run that plant, we knew that there was no evacuation plan. Uh, there isn't one. You can't get uh, the six to ten million people in that area out of there in an accident. It's just not possible. The other point that needs to be made is this plant is running outside of its license. Its license expired for one unit three years ago, another one a year ago. Uh, nobody in their right mind would dream of building a nuclear power plant uh, 25, 35 miles from New York City. Their license has expired. A nuclear regulatory commission asserting the public interest would deny them a license extension. This plant needs to be shut down in the name of common sense. All right. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Um, I'd like to now turn to questions and answers. Um, Roxana, the operator, is going to be facilitating that process. Roxana, please. At this time, if you'd like to ask a question, please press the star and one on your touchtone telephone. You may withdraw your question at any time by pressing the pound key. Once again, to ask a question, please press the star and one on your touchtone telephone. And we'll pause a brief moment to allow questions to queue. And we'll take our first question from Jennifer Peltz with the Associated Press. Please go ahead. Hi, everybody. Uh, I wondered what the process is for going forward with this petition. Is there a time frame by which the commission has to respond, or is it um, not quite as firm as that? Uh, so this is Dick Ayers answering that question. Uh, yes. The, um, uh, there is no, uh, uh, re no requirement uh, as to the timetable for a response. Um, the reason we've asked for emergency consideration is that we believe this needs to be considered right away. Um, and we, of course, are also saying that the commission needs to give us a response before the plant would be restarted. So that would probably place a 30 to 40 day limit on how soon the Commission would have to respond. If if I could just add this thought, a failure of the Commission to respond is a denial of our request. Uh, this is an emergency, and uh, if the plant is allowed uh, to restart without Commission action, the Commission is effectively uh, denied uh, our request, and I think that uh, we will uh, very seriously consider what further legal action. Uh, we wish to take. Uh, and that, that second speaker was Mr. Freeman. All right, let's 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 go to the next question, please. <clears throat> and we'll take our next question from John Beers with AFP. Please go ahead. Hi there. Uh, I um, haven't had a chance to go through all the documents yet, but thank you for holding the call. Um, what has been uh, the reaction so far um, of other people like, for example, the governor of New York or the attorney general to what you're saying about um, this problem at Indian Point? This is Dave Freeman. Uh, the governor of New York has been on record asking the plant be shut down uh, ever since he was attorney general and including uh, uh, recently when he's governor. So he has uh, uh, been very vigorous in asking uh, the NRC to take action and the in the in the uh, company uh, to uh, shut the plant uh, down and many others in the state 
they've been making the same request uh, for a number of years. There's opposition to the uh, granting them another 20-year license extension uh, that's undertaken, led by the Attorney General and many NGOs in the state. Uh, frankly, the opposition, the Indian Point, goes all the way back to 1994. I encountered it uh, when I was uh, running the plant and for that reason kept the plant down for two and a half years. So uh, the NRC just doesn't see eye to eye with all these regulators? They all, all have other not been urged to do so as vigorously as we did this morning, and we have uh, every reason and hope that they're going to respond to our emergency petition and do their job. Where would the power come from if it's not like say say you get your wish and um, Indian Point is the 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 reactor that's down is not brought back and the reactor that's up is brought down. Um, where does the power come from over the summer? The, new, uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission issued an opinion on April 20th, 2015, in which they uh, prescribed that the New York independent system operator, which runs the grid, must maintain uh, operating reserves of 2,620 megawatts, and uh, 1,310 of those megawatts have to be in the southeast New York area. So there is ample reserves in the system today. As a CEO of utility, I can just tell you that you always have to have enough reserves on hand if your large unit breaks down, and Indian Point is a large unit. So there, there, uh, there's no uh, uh, concern uh, about power shortages. If there were, the, New York, the, the NISO would be engaged in a massive conservation effort right now. And they have Apple opportunity to do though. They take bids for load management. This is a sophisticated organization that has the power supply under underway, and uh, it, it, you know, Indian Point's not who is not operating now, but the reserves are there. That's the answer. And if they weren't, we'd be having an energy efficiency and conservation program uh, like we did in California when we had a shortage and it worked. Uh, that speaker was um, was Dave Freeman. Uh, this is Damon Moglin. I'd just like to add that I would encourage um, folks to take a look at a very important report that was commissioned by our colleagues at NRDC and Riverkeeper by Synapse, which was published a couple of years ago, um, that goes into full detail about these surplus issues. And um, uh, this is an important issue, and I'd also en you encourage you to take a look at that report. All right, can we go to... Hey, Damon, may I add one thing? Yes, please. Hey, Arnie. Uh, this is Arnie Gunderson. You know, um, uh, Indian Point 3 uh, claims that uh, it's unlikely it'll have this problem. Uh, if it shuts down now in May, it's probably less than 30 days it could determine if it has a problem or not. Um, if it's clean, it could be up and running again in time for this uh, this suggested peak in uh, in July and August. If it if it is damaged, I'd suggest that it's much better to be to be shut down rather than uh, uh, putting damage, putting stress on those baffle plates. So um, the time to shut Indian Point down from uh, a, a load standpoint is now. Let's look. Right, and that was uh, Arnie Gunderson. Can I, can I ask for the next question? And we have a follow-up question from Jennifer Peltz with the Associated Press. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the uh, NRC blog post to which you refer in your legal papers and which concludes with uh, the guy saying that the NRC will ensure the condition is fully understood and addressed prior to the plant returning to service. I take it you all don't credit that. Um, why not? Um, this is uh, this is Damon Moglin, and I'll, I'll take a first shot at answering that. Maybe Dick Ayers may want to add. But the, the bottom line is this. Um, that, that blog post, which in and of itself is kind of remarkable that the NRC is taking action through a blog and not through any regulatory action, is, I think, rather misleading in that none of the kind of actual public regulatory actions 
that normally the NRC should be taking in a case like this one, sending in an augmented inspection team, issuing a confirmatory action letter which takes charge of the situation. None of that has been done. So what you have there is a blog post from a public relations officer at the NRC which ends with an empty reassurance that everything is okay. And no, Jennifer, I don't think that's enough. I don't think that that's enough to calm concerns of the millions of people in New York who are worried about this reactor. I don't know if Dick wants to add anything further about what, what we may be asking for. Well, I, I just add one thing, which is, um, you know, we, what we're asking for basically is for the NRC to use the authority it has by statute to step in and make sure the plan is safe. Um, at this point, the commission has done really nothing to accomplish that, and obviously a blog post does not carry the force of law, um, which the commission has, uh, and because it has that force, it can require the plant to be kept closed until it's safe. It can put conditions on how it's operated. Um, it basically can do almost anything to make sure that the people who live within uh, distance of that plant are safe. Jennifer, did you, did you have a follow-up, or can we ask for another question? Okay, why don't, we, why don't we go to the next question? Once again, if you'd like to ask a question, it is star and one on your touchtone telephone. And we'll pause a brief moment to allow questions to queue. Once again, if you'd like to ask a question, it is star and one on your touchtone telephone. And it appears we have no further questions at this time. All right. Um, great. Thank you all for being on this call. Um, there are contact numbers if you want to ask any follow-up questions to any of our speakers. Um, on behalf of Friends of the Earth, I'd like to thank you for attending this important telepress conference and for covering this extremely important safety issue. Thank you. This does conclude today's conference. You may disconnect at any time and have a wonderful day. Thanks for listening to the Fairwinds Energy Education Podcast. We will keep you informed.